Well, good morning. Good morning, sir. It was a little brisk weather out there this morning. I'm glad yeah, to have you we here. had a good travel over this morning. I have uh, the first question, and on, on your questionnaire, it's question number one. And as we move through this, uh, as we move through the questions, uh, each board member will tell you which question it was on the, on the sheet, just in case you need notes. Okay. Um, number one, describe all experience you've had in public education and how such experience has specifically prepared you for the position of director of schools. Okay. Is my microphone on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Just double checking there. Um, first of all, I want to take the opportunity to thank the board. I'm very appreciative. I'm humbled to be here in your presence this morning. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to interview for this most important position in the school system. I've often, as you probably have looked at my data, my resume work, um, I'm a former school superintendent, both as a county director of schools and for the State Department of Education, okay? Uh, both locations being a level five school superintendent, level five district, and or a level five school. So I'm humbled to be here. Uh, by the way, I do want to applaud you for your work uh, that you have laid the foundation for to, as I've looked into your district, what a great district it is. You should be very proud and thankful and appreciative of the work you've been able to get accomplished in working for the students you represent and the communities that you represent. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, once again, a lot of this is on my beta, if you will. I assume you do have a copy. Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, of course, it's a work history. Um, I basically I did a lot of jobs coming out of high school. I'm a graduate of Sunbright High School, uh, valedictorian, class of 1982. Uh, I did have an opportunity uh, to take a look at many areas, one of those being going on the law school. I chose to go the education route. Um, anyway, I spent uh, ten and a half years working for the Walmart Sam's Club Corporation and also about a year and a half, 18 months, if you will, working for Lowe's Home Improvement. Both of those uh, companies, as you know, I'm certain are good Wall Street performers. Um, I'm just an old country boy that's worked hard. Very humble, very appreciative of my background. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, you know, you'll see about me is that I'm a very hard worker. Um, I've had 22 years of, work, of educational experience, serving both as a teacher. I also worked as a teacher for 11 years and then also 11 years of supervisory or administrative experience. I started off as a, a PE teacher. I've taught math and uh, reading remediation in the state of Florida when I was in grad school at the University of Central Florida working for the Brevard County School System. In 2009, my wife, by the way, my wife is Laura to my immediate right in the back. I want to introduce her to you. My wife of 32 years, she's been a great support in everything that uh, we've been able to get accomplished in our, in our career. But I will say this, um, you know, the 22 years I had, no disappointments along the way. By year 17, I was a director of schools, promoted to my first directorship in Claiborne County School System. I took over a school system with very similar dynamics here in Cumberland County, as I got to looking into a comparison of similarities and differences, if you will, um, very similar in nature. 12 schools in both places. Uh, Claiborne County, about 4,100 students at the time I took over. Um, and then here, a little over 7,400. So uh, budget-wise, about uh, 38 million in Claiborne. Uh, we always ran in the black the two years I was there. I might add that I took over a level one school system. I was there for two years. Uh, that's what the contract the board gave me, uh, being my first directorship. Uh, we went from a level one to a level nine at the, or level five, I'm sorry, nine months later at the end of my first year. And then we actually duplicated that feat the following year as I was making transition to um, the State Department of Education to serve one of their schools, which is Allen C. York Institute in Fentress County. Now, with uh, my background, I might add, I've never had any lawsuits in the four years I've been a school superintendent. That was a question that the Claiborne County Board asked me, how was I gonna keep lawsuits down? But no lawsuits at either place, either in Claiborne County or with the uh, Tennessee Department of Education. Um, the budget at York Institute was $6.8 million. Um, once again, no lawsuits. And by the way, I've had experience dealing with both um, BEP, 
and in Claiborne, where I had to help uh, the finance um, uh, manager to present the county budget to both the board and to the county commissioners. So I do have experience working along those lines as a, as a basic uh, superintendent <clears throat> duty. Um, also at York, we didn't have any lawsuits. I was on the job six months, and as you know, COVID kind of made its way in, and we had to shut the building down. Um, two months later, we started working in preparation in March when we closed schools down, much like you. We took a look at developing our uh, graduation plan, something I'm very proud of, in addition to our reopening plan. It does indicate on my VITA that the State Department of Education used both of those as um, guidelines, models, if you will, on those two documents for the state of Tennessee, school districts across the state. <coughs> that is something I'm very proud of, uh, that the work, not anything that I did, but the work of our team did. Um, I think as a director of schools, uh, I kind of always put myself last. I'm the least most important person in the district. And I think that's part of being a servant leader. Um, and I do think that a part of leadership is this, that, um, you know, you have to be genuine. You have to be intentional. I try to be both of those. So that's very important, I think, in the work that we're trying to do with uh, making sure that our kids and our personnel have the resources and the tools they need to do a job effectively. One of the things I might add that I've always kind of, two things I might add, I'm sorry, is you might wonder, well, Joe, how have you been successful? Like I said, it's not anything I've done. I'm going to give uh, the good Lord credit. I am a Christian. I make mistakes just like anyone else. But I will say this. One of the things that we did was work off of this premise that we're going to do everything we can to improve 1% today. Now, that's not a lot, but it's something. <coughs> So part of that becomes a, a mental <coughs> framework, if you will. Hey, and then the other thing, one of the things that we know about our kids is this. If you look at some of the research and some of the data out there, research shows that our kids that are 18 right now, in 20 years, as we're preparing and we're teaching today's kids, that 80% of all jobs haven't been invented just yet. And technology is going to drive many of those changes. If I'm a high school student or an elementary or middle school, I know you don't have middle schools here in the district, but if I'm a student today, it's an exciting time to be a student in education. It does have its challenges. But however, I think we can work through those and do great things for kids. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pierce. Uh, Mr. Miller. I think you've already answered, answered my question, but it's what you are, all you, were, you have said. But I'm going to ask it anyway. It was number two on the uh, on the list, you know, questions. And okay. it was what, yeah, number two. What are, you, are the most important characteristics a director of school should possess? And I think you already answered that. Well, I'll take just a brief moment to maybe address another item or two um, with me. Uh, what you see is what you get. Okay, I don't, I don't believe in, I'm genuine, I'm intentional, very hard worker, very hard worker, okay? As a matter of fact, uh, I did bring, and time won't permit this, samples of my work from both a county school system and the State Department of Education, <clears throat> where I have worked with a board, okay, and I also have worked with an advisory council. Okay, now, being with the State Department of Ed, um, you know, we didn't have uh, BEP, so our budget was based off of um, revenues um, that we would receive on state allocation from the State Department and then also on expenditures earned or uh, uh, revenues earned, if you will. So I do think that, uh, you know, my samples of my work, what you see here kind of in a nutshell is this. On communication with the board and with, uh, uh, with teachers and staff, I think it's very important that we have good communication. Okay, these are weekly updates that I either sent out, okay, uh, to either the board, our teachers, our staff, to our community, to our principals, and et cetera. Now, I know time won't permit that, but I want you to, I just want you to know that I do have samples of some of my work, okay, very proud of. But I think it's because it's needed, okay. I know some directors of schools send updates out weekly, some in a newsletter, that's some form or fashion with regard to communication. So we have to be a very good communicator. Um, I'm probably really good 
at building relationships. Okay, I think a director of schools needs to have that uh, uniqueness about him or her. I also think that it's important for the director of schools to be a strong relationship builder. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, some of my time has been very short. I use at places two years, not a long time. However, uh, I've been able, the good Lord's blessed us any place I've been with getting good, um, you know, quantifiable feedback from all accountability measures. So I do think the person needs to be, the director needs to be genuine. Um, I think they need to honor their word and do what they say they will do. I really think that's important. So they need to be a good listener. You know, communication research does say this. Sometimes a person needs to listen three times more than they speak. I think that's very important. I learn a lot by listening, by talking to people. So I think your next director needs to have those outstanding qualities, among others. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hale. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, my question is number eight. Um, how would you develop and maintain a high morale among district employees? That's a very good question. And um, as I looked at that, I kind of alluded to the fact that morale is so important. If you'll notice on, uh, I'm assuming you may have this as well, I submitted a document <clears throat> the first 100 days on the job. Okay, it's a three-page document that I wanted the board to have a copy of because the reason I did that, uh, and I learned this from Mike Krzyzewski, coach at Duke University in my coaching days. He told me one time, he said, Joe, he said, I went to a couple of his coaching clinics and he said, the reason I coach a timeout is because I don't believe other coaches always do. That was one of my major takeaways. Okay, now, if I take that same principle and I put it from the sports world over into the educational arena, I think building morale is a top-notch concern right now. Okay, it has to be because COVID has swept in. <clears throat> it's changed the nature of our students. Not only have our students suffered learning loss, They've suffered relationship building. You know, the wearing of masks has probably kept some of our educators from building those relationships with the facial gestures and comments and things that kids need to hear, the reinforcement. Um, it's also, uh, with regard to morale, it's hard, even if COVID-19 had not introduced itself. Here's why. We're in a stage right now in education throughout the state of Tennessee and nationally, if you will, Education is a fast-paced environment. Many times we go to promote a change or an initiative. Sometimes, sometimes, we don't take the opportunity to take a look at how successful or unsuccessful some things have been. You know, when you take a look at morale, sometimes I believe leadership starts at the top. It starts, you know, in education with the leader, research does show this, uh, leadership has a multiplier effect, if you will. I think building morale starts with not only the director of schools, board, yes, you, as well, right? Because we're to complement each other. We are to make each other stronger and better for the overall benefit of improving and enhancing student achievement. But some of the research shows uh, that uh, when principals are well-trained on the administrative end, that, um, you know, they'll go and impact as many as 20 teachers. It's a domino effect. Those 20 teachers then ultimately have an opportunity to impact potentially as many as four or 500 other students. And that's based on some research from back around 2004, but nevertheless, it is timely in today's educational world. So I think keeping morale high starts with building good relationships with people and having those good communication skills. I really do. And uh, like I said, that's just part of my nature, who I am, and I love working with people. From the relationship building standpoint, I'm a unique candidate. Thank you. Right. Uh, my first question is uh, number four on the list. Uh, describe your goals for education in Cumberland County. That is a great question. And as I looked at that, uh, I took a look at some of the things that your school system is currently doing. <clears throat> Compliment you here as well, board, on the work you've done. Your benefits packages second to none. When I looked at that and I found out that, with all due respect, the board is providing 
100% insurance for the employee, 100% for siblings, and 45% of the spouse's insurance. I know a lot of superintendents around the state of Tennessee, but I don't know any other, uh, actually maybe with the exception of one, that's probably doing or coming close to what you're doing. So I think that that is really great, which allows me then to domino effect over into how do I see the district. I really believe that our, I'm gonna say our, assuming, you know, you get, I get placed on your list of thoughts as a consideration. Cumberland County Schools has the opportunity now, this day and time right now, to take a stand and become the best school system in the state of Tennessee. The best. Once again, I'll roll back to a coaching metaphor. If I was taking over a team and as you see on my Vita, I'm level five. If I'm taking over a team and I walk in and I ask those athletes, would you like to be a champion? Well, what do you think the answer is gonna be? They're gonna nod and agree yes, because no one wants to lose, right? There's <clears throat> also a price in many cases that have to be paid. I used to teach my student athletes that one of the first things a person has to do to be a winner is to die to themselves, which means this, I told you I'm the least most important person in the school system. So the student's success, the success of our personnel, our instructional staff, our classified staff. I used to be a custodian. I used to be a dishwasher. I've done those roles. You know, becoming the best in the state, it does come out of price. Now, can I tell you what that price might be? Your budget is something certainly that's, that's really great. You're almost $60 million uh, in your budget. Okay, I, I think that's super. But the goals would be for us to be the best school system in the state. You're already doing some great things with ACT prep. By the way, with ACT, it's not something you wait to the ninth grade to take a look at. <coughs> it's something we start doing in pre-K. Yes, we start asking those challenging questions or even our little ones. One of the things I might add to as well, when I left York Institute um, and I resigned, I, you know, I'd done everything that I felt like I could do. We were level five, we'd gone through a $2 million renovation project in the middle of COVID. Those plans had sat there on the shelf for 15 years. We did that project in less than seven or eight months. They sat there, so I thought, okay, this is an opportunity for us to do some great work. We also laid the, frame, the fra framework and the groundwork for York Institute, but to become a STEM school. They will, when I left in June, in August, they received the Cogni accreditation. You know that's a prestigious rec uh, recognition. Next month in May, they are scheduled to receive, unless something goes south on this, they're actually scheduled to receive the STEM certification. So the groundwork that we lay, CTE is so very important keeping in balance with CTE and Gen Ed. You know, for instance, I'm an old CTE director. Once again, I'll reference my Vita. I was a 2014 CTE director of the year in the state of Tennessee, doing a lot with solar work in Morgan County. Um, you know, with CTE, uh, you know, some of the research shows people think, well, you can't go do this or that or make or sustain a living. It's one of the things statistically that we know. A person with an industry certification <coughs> CTE, for example, typically makes ten to twenty thousand dollars more a year than a person graduating from college with a four-year degree in humanities. I mean, that's that's significant. I think sometimes we are fooled a little bit, or our minds not really straightforwardly focused with regard to how important our CTE programs are. We don't need all scholarly people out in society to make society work effectively and efficiently. We need those people that can repair our automobiles and, and cut our hair and do those different types of work or machine parts. So I think our CTE work is important. One of the focuses from the State Department of Ed is now to make sure that kids in elementary and middle school with career exploration are really looking at what they might want to do when they grow up. Now, the back side of that, kids don't know, do they? Typically, they don't. However, 
the premise there is that it's not too early for kids to start thinking about what they might want to go into. And I always encourage students, have two or three things that they might do. You know, have two or three colleges they might want to go to or trade schools. So I think that's very important. But goals, we can be the best school system in the state, and I don't just say that. I really believe it because you really have a lot of great things going here in your school system. You really do. Okay, thank you. Mr. Brock. Good morning. Good morning, sir. <clears throat> uh, mine will be question number three, and, and I'm going to change it just a little bit. Uh, the question asks for what are the two greatest challenges you feel like the school system is facing, and how would you deal with that? <clears throat> I want you to just pick one. What is the greatest challenge? Facing our school system. Facing our, our school, school system. system. Uh, you make that very challenging, because I had two or three things on my list. <laughs> But if I just mention them to you, but I'll discuss Can one. you rank them then? Okay, very good questions. We'll take it. <laughs> is, is this a TCAP question? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, that is an excellent question. I thought long and hard about this information. One of the things that I do know is this, with regard to instructional salaries and also classified personnel salaries, um, on average, school systems will... Cumberland County is part of the 81 Act, okay, with regard to finances. And, you know, I know that. I know uh, research. I know about rural school systems, et cetera. But typically a school system will run about 70, 80 percent of their overall budget with regard to payroll. Right now, currently in Cumberland County, you're sitting uh, at 81 percent. Now, don't be alarmed. It's, I'm going to round up here and call it 81 percent, okay, in my looking at that information. Uh, we know money motivates. Yes. Okay. Uh, also, I looked, and I'm not going to dig real deep into the money, but I want you to know that that is on my radar. I can't tell you exactly right now because I've looked. It may be a hot, you know, we collect money, do this and that. I also know in my research that you took a look this past year at in, uh, allocating $350,000 in order to help uh, account for step-up raises, et cetera, and... Um, you know, probably, I will tell you this, at least on my number crunching, probably around another, give or take, $500,000, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Um, in addition to the three hundred and fifty that you've already allocated, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about a 1.5% to a 2% pay increase. I can tell you that. Now I'll go over to my other ones. Um, I think one of the areas that uh, has to be looked at, uh, you know, is uh, morale. Uh, with COVID, with the fact of the, I uh, addressed this a little earlier, with a fast-paced change in education, uh, sometimes it's hard to, to keep focused on what's working, maybe what's not. We need to take this away, add this. I think morale, it's a challenge for any director of schools. And then also, um, you know, uh, I think it's important for uh, personnel to have mental toughness and execution. Uh, that's important because sometimes we don't get to say what we're doing in education. Sometimes we receive directives or sometimes we have a legal barrier or a law that keeps us from doing this or that. Yes. For example, with ESSER money. Now ESSER is scheduled, uh, ESSER 1 is scheduled to be spent by this September, ESSER 2 in 23, ESSER 3 in 2024. There was some information that came out last year with the Biden administration of a possibility of ESSER 4. Now, we have not seen that materialize just yet. But anyway, know that that right there, uh, you know, sometimes we get told how we're going to spend it because the State Department of Ed has to report back to the U.S. Department of Education. For example, we were allocated districts statewide were allocated 20% had to be spent on learning loss, yes? And so I know you're aware of that. Probably of the mental toughness and execution, um, the, um, you know, the morale, and then also with uh, ins uh, instructional and classified uh, salaries. Now, I don't know, I may have some teachers or I may have some classified personnel sitting here right now uh, in the group. Um, you know, I think morale would be probably a, uh, I would say a heightened concern, even though they're all three a heightened concern. Um, a lot of times, sometimes people just need to be told genuinely that they're doing a really good job. 
you know, I, as a principal or a CT director for a school system like in Morgan, you know, I didn't need that. I just went into work every single day as a director of schools. I felt like that the work that we were doing and the work that we would do here is greater, uh, you know, than anything I could possibly get accomplished by myself. My um, strength is probably my uh, vision. My weakness probably is my vision. However, I say that, that may be somewhat unparalleled to what you might expect to hear. Because my vision might be a weakness, I can tell you where I'd like to see us in three to five years as a school system. What I can't do is necessarily in each area of operation tell you exactly how to get there. That's why it's so important, for guys, uh, for the director of schools to have a good team around them. Morale and how do you build morale, uh, you know, we in Claiborne County and at York Institute, we took part in the Youth Trust Program, which is an employee uh, benefit recognition program at no cost to a school system. Uh, you know, so that is something that I've used as a recognition piece. Even at the central office, I've all, uh, always used like a employee of the month. Okay, that is something that I learned in my background work with both Walmart and Sam's Club with the Waltons and then also with a Lowe's Home Improvement from an organizational standpoint. You know, both of those organizations have been built on much success, much hard work, and lots of planning. But they also knew this, just like I can say about our district. Our people are our greatest asset. That help? Okay. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Great question. All right, Mr. <clears throat> King. I have question 18. How important is an organization chart for a director? And will you have immediate recommendations for changes? I knew you would ask that one. <clears throat> No, organizational chart, and I've used this in both of my directorships as a county director in Cleveland and at the state uh, level for the Department of Education. An organizational chart is a very good tool to use and to have. Uh, I know it probably says director of schools and or the board up toward the top, depending on you know how it's aligned and how it's set up. But I think a director is to complement the board, a board is to complement the director as well. Hence, therefore, you get into that relationship building. It's so important to know each other, okay? And to know, also know what each other's tendencies are or might be on any given topic. One of the things that we know about organizational charts are um, they're useful in giving uh, a director, a board, if you will, or the school district, you know, a teacher. Uh, it could be a custodian, a, a member of the classified personnel. It gives us a quick snapshot of what our employees are doing with regard to, you know, how the flow chart is laid out. Another big bonus that it provides a director of schools is this. Uh, if we have a person retiring, if we need to maybe, uh, I know a school system that doubled up on a, uh, an elementary and a secondary ed supervisor. Okay, not ideal, but they did. It also gives the director of schools and the board the information to take a look at any time we may be thinking about asking a member of our personnel staff to take on another role, okay? So it's a great organizational tool. As far as change goes, you know, there's this psychological side of change, and that word change is actually in the question. I think a lot of times we think we'll do an initiative without taking a look at the psychological piece of change. If we don't look at the psychological benefit or uh, pieces of change, the components, then probably what we might end up getting is failed, a failed change initiative. For example, um, uh, William Bridges and a researcher last name Mitchell back in 2000 took a look at change and the psychological pieces of change. Remember that people are human beings and behaviors are going all over the place, right? We're interacting, we're teaching, we're brainstorming, we're doing what's best for kids. But three areas of keys on that research was, first of all, it has an end. Remember, whatever it might be, whatever type of change we might look at, with all due respect, board, has to end. It didn't work for this type of reason. So an ending 
to that previous initiative has to be a focal point. The other thing that the research showed was a neutral zone. A neutral zone being this is an area where as you bring on a new initiative with behavioral change, you take a look at the positive aspects of the change. Obviously, you want to highlight all the positives. The change, you've researched it, you've brainstormed, and here we go. All right, and then we attempt to work to roll that out. Now, that rollout has to be strategically planned. I'll go back to my work that I can show right here in this notebook with regard to the STEM rollout at York. Okay, we just didn't sit down and say we were going to do this. Okay, so we take a look at the third area of change now, which is called the four P's. P's as in Paul, for example. Okay, the four P's are this. Uh, we take a look at the purpose of the change. We take a look at the plan. Okay, so we have the purpose, the plan, and we have the... Um, um, I'm probably going to forget those other two, but we have the purpose, we have the plan. Oh, we have the part and the role that we're going to, that we're going to play, and then we have the presentation of the change. Exactly what is that change initiative going to look like? So when we look at change, you know, if it's are we going to take a look at doing this or that, or pulling money or from here or there to help uh, maybe give uh, <clears throat> excuse me additional pay raises to personnel? And I'm using that merely as an example. It could be you know, a number of things that we look at that we might take a look at change. You know, we take a look at that behavior side as well. When I was always looking to hire a teacher in my building, when I was a principal or as a director, sometimes if I was looking at that organizational chart, for example, uh, in Claiborne, my a data coach at the central office retired. Before we advertised that change, we took a look at revising the job description and we use this research to help us get there. At the state level, I had a guidance counselor at York that retired. I also, or we, leadership team and myself, school administration, we took a look at how we were going to revamp that position. What did that position need that we were not getting to best serve kids? So change is very important as far as me walking in year one and doing some sort of astronomical change. I don't know that I would. Rest assured of this, here's a number one question with anything, but I'll address it here on the concept of change. If board, if we ask ourselves, should we do this or that for kids? And the answer is yes. I think we would be challenged by today's standards to do everything that we can within the budget, if it's resources, if it's programs, if it's teachers, if it's staff development, professional development, whatever is needed, to try to do our best that we can. The answer is yes, we need to try to find a way to do it. But no astronomical changes, not anything major. Uh, I will tell you uh, another similarity in this district. I know in Cumberland <clears throat> County, I know a handful of people. But I will tell you in Claiborne County, I knew a handful of people before taking my first directorship. <coughs> so some similarities there once again. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. King. Sorry for having to get up and step out a few minutes ago. My allergies, allergies are rough. Okay. Um, number 11, what are your strategies for ensuring equal opportunities for all students in Cumberland County Schools? Okay, number 11. Well, first of all, um, you know, a number of things here with regard to, um, you know, the school system, Cumberland County is predominantly white, Caucasian, okay? You are starting to see uh, increased numbers, I think, uh, that I've looked at with regard to your Hispanic student population. At some point, uh, you know, not all schools, for example, probably have ESL, uh, English as a Second Language Teacher, and if so, those may be part-time. There might, there might be another um, area of opportunity if, uh, one or two members of personnel are needed, especially if you're starting to see Hispanic-speaking students and where English may or not be their primary language where we have to fulfill that requirement as required by law, okay? When you look at ensuring equality, one of the things that I noticed uh, in my research uh, in preparation for the interview is uh, especially at the two high schools because here we're talking about ensuring equal opportunity across the board, yes? Um, I noticed that the two high schools do not have 
not graduation coaches per se by that title. Uh, you know, now there may be people doing those roles, but not so much by that title. So I think as far as ensuring equality, uh, remember equality and equity are not the same thing. Equity is what's fair. Equality is what's equal. Yes. And what's equitable may not be equal. What's equal may not be equitable. So they kind of contradict uh, or reverse each other, if you will. But identifying our kids that are at risk, I think the earlier that we can in the educational process, you know, it was Mark Twain that once said, uh, schooling is what we do in the here and the now. Education <laughs> is a lifelong process. <laughs> yes, I'm the type of person with that improvement of 1% every day. I try to learn something new every day. I try to get better myself. I just don't challenge people to do that, right? I have to be a continuing learner, a lifelong learner myself. So we have to do a really good job of analyzing our data, allow our data to help drive some of our instructional decision making, if you will. For example, if I'm looking at developing, I'll go back to in reference CTE for just a moment, career technical ed. If I'm looking at bringing, I know she has some good CTE programs of study, so I compliment you there, right? We know that in 20 years, when those kids are 38, they're seniors in high school now, we know that healthcare is going to be out there, engineering, computer science, et cetera. But we also have to take a look at, in our labor market data, both locally here in the county and then also at a regional level. For example, where are our kids most likely, and our kids are our customers, right? That's a relationship back to my business experience early on in my career. Uh, we have to take a look at where our kids are most likely to go to work. We have to prepare them adequately as much as we can to make that transition from school to the workforce and or from school to the work uh, school to the workforce or from school to post secondary. So the more that we can allow our data to help drive our decisions, I know in CTE they like that labor market data before you develop a program. And I know you have criminal justice, but I'm using that as an example, right? Uh, you know. Uh, for instance, uh, the Career Tech Center that I was a uh, director of in Morgan County is right there next to the prison. So I didn't have too many discipline issues. <laughs> Sense of humor, right? <laughs> but, you know, I also know this from my work with the prison there as well, you know, that students didn't necessarily need criminal justice to make that transition to the workforce. Now, we look at bringing in criminal justice, right? Uh, but they're a very hard teacher to get a hold of. An attorney with a law degree and a criminal justice degree, for example, are not the same two, right? They don't look at the credentialing the same. The State Department of Ed does not. So a little bit different there. But I think as far as what kids want, most of all, or need, you might say, when they graduate and they cross that line, they want options and choices. Really, you know, if I'm getting an athletic scholarship, I'd like to have three or four to make my choice from, right? And, uh, you know, our, our folks in GNA, you know, our top 25% guys, they're going to go on and do great things. They're on the other end of the continuum, perhaps with, you know, maybe special ed, economically disadvantaged, or special ed at around 10%. You're economically disadvantaged here in the district, around 10.3, so that's 700 plus students for both of those categories. You know, we have to do our job, too, as far as educating. You know, there are programs in place to help students on that end. If our top 25% is going to go on and flourish and do great things, then, and there are programs in place for the other end of the continuum with all due respect, then one of the focuses might be on our middle 50, right? What are we doing to create things? You know, we know this from an abundance of research. Teachers. Bringing effective teachers, board and myself, and being able to hire effective teachers, it is always this. I promise you, but you already know this, it's the number one variable. Always, always, always. The determining factor in most cases, and in some cases, as teachers and educators, we have to overpower SES, the background our kids come from. Teachers are always the number one variable in helping to determine student success. I think the kids would agree with that as well.
So ensuring uh, <clears throat> quality, if you will, or equal opportunities. Uh, kids are going into the military, they're going on to college, they're going to work, they're going to work for a couple of years. You know, um, our ready graduate indicator, you know, as I've looked around the district is give or take, okay, a little bit here, 35 or 40 percent. I dealt with that type of issue as well at York, and one of the things that we found, that told me this data, that meant that six out of kids were not ready. Yes? So if you look at the State uh, Department of Ed requirement on that, as far as being evaluated as a system, you know, uh, we're in the high 30s here, okay? So that tells me some work could be done in that component of work to ensure those possibilities for kids to have success. We know uh, both of your high schools, I've glanced, are right at that 21, okay, with regard to ACT. That's one of the variables that the Department of Ed uses. We also know that they can take uh, four EPSOs, early post-secondary opportunities, and then we also know that they can take two early post-secondary opportunities and an industry certification, or they can do an industry certification and take the ASVAB test. You know, one of the things that the State Department delayed on they delayed in getting that number out there, what they wanted as a reasonable score. And by the way, those industry certifications are not the number of kids that take the exam. You know it's the number of kids that pass. I can go take an exam, but may not pass it. Yes? Okay. Excuse me. So, you know, we have to be aware of that, but reading is a part of that ASVAB test. That's why in the low 30s there, on that requirement on the ASVAB, you'll see that number as low as it is. Okay, but we do get evaluated as a school system on ensuring these opportunities for kids. Thank you. Okay. I might add, you were very knowledgeable about our district, so you've done some homework. Well, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the, the question is number seven on your list. Describe and explain your leadership style and how you believe it can benefit our district. Well, on leadership style, one of the things I was hoping to do, like I said, I'm very personable. One of the things, and that's it, just, it's just my nature, is I was hoping to personally walk around, so I apologize to you for this, and shake your hand and introduce myself to you. I feel very comfortable being here. I really do. And I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. One of the things, and I'll address this now, is you know from my beta that I'm back in the classroom. And I am. But I'm a level five school superintendent. Okay? Now, I do work hard. Okay? Um, and I'll get to leadership style here in just a moment. On uh, leadership style, uh, you know, uh, you have to take a look at what's most important, and that's people. Um, you know, on leadership style, for instance, I think you have to be genuine. I'm a little authoritative. Now, authoritative, uh, you're probably aware of this. I'm not autocratic, which means a person walks in, you won't see this side of me. I, I learn every day. I really do. I, I'm humbled. God's allowed me to do everything in life that he's allowed me to do up to this point, and you as well, and everyone in this room. But a leader needs to be, a director needs to, mine's authoritative and or visionary. And I illustrated earlier where I'm a visionary. I believe that's my strength. A lot of times we look at five years down the road. I do think sometimes with an action plan, and I know districts, yours as well, does have a five-year strategic plan. Sometimes things can get lost in the shuffle. I'm not saying that yours is. Sometimes a three-year plan is uh, perhaps a little bit more effective and efficient for taking a look at where we need to go from point A to point B, and that five-year plan can blend in with some of that. So I'm more authoritative, like I said, as a visionary. I'm probably also a little bit, if you will, of course you look at pace setting, I'm not like that, but now demo, or, uh, autocratic is this, a person walks in, uh, don't let these notebooks here frighten you, Okay, uh, I'm not the smartest person in the room. But that's really what autocratic is, right? Uh, you know, I don't have to know every answer to every question I do today, right? That's why it's so important for the leader uh, more to have, I must have said something funny. <laughs> it's why it's so important for the leader to have great people around him or her. 
It really is. So I'm, you know, the lazy fair type leader. I'm a little bit of that as well. Authoritative probably across the board. I really am a people person. Uh, I like talking to you or I like talking to you about your feedback. Where do you think we can go? But more importantly, how do we get there from point A to point B? How are we going to get there in 12 months? You know, how did I know that we were going to uh, be a level, I took over a level one school system. Our chronic absenteeism was rough, right? It was when the school, uh, the state average on chronic absenteeism was up around, you know, um, 13%. Claiborne County was at 22.5. How did I know we could get there? Okay, how did I know? Well, I believed, and I just did this. I told the board when the board appointed me or hired me in Claiborne, I said, I'm going to work as hard as I can every single day for kids and personnel. And then I'm going to leave the rest. I, I told them, I said, I'm going to leave the results up to God. And that's just an example that I can give you. But as far as one major leadership type, I'm probably that visionary authoritative. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a great question. Right, Mr. Safty. Um, what question are we on? Second. Second. Okay. Could I throw so, something out here just as an idea? Yes. Doc no, Miller, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Time is running short, I and mean, there are a lot of questions. I was just wondering if we could invent something called a little rapid fire question and answer. We can. I, I, I just want you to be able to get in uh, your responses to as many questions as possible, and, and I would hate for the clock to run out. I, I, just an idea, folks. Okay. I appreciate that. Sounds right. Thank you, sir. All right. So I'm going to skip question two because I think you've already addressed that. Okay. The question was what experience you have in fiscal operations and developing a proposed district uh, budget. So I'm going to go to number three, and I want a brief answer, and I want a visionary answer. First of all, I'm going to give you an opinion. My opinion is that our school system has done everything possible. Our teachers have been excellent in working with our students in K through three. However, across the state, including Cumberland County, we see that only 30% of the students graduate moving on from the third grade to the fourth grade are competent in reading. So what are you going to do about that? Given that we've already done We've already followed the state rules and guidelines. Where do we need to go next to improve those reading skills? Great question. And uh, yes, uh, I have seen the, the, the numbers on that. One of the things that I can see that you've been doing is not so much, and this is a good thing, because it takes the relationship building factor out of the equation between teacher and student. Assuming, and I don't know every single thing that has been done, but I think a good place to start is talk to a school system that has done excellent, that maybe is uh, opposite of what we're seeing here in Cumberland County. Sometimes it's a good idea to pick up the phone or an email or you know call a such and such district on the, from the central office or from the school and take a look at what you're doing. I think a good uh, opportunity is not to reinvent the wheel. Okay, now one of the things that you're doing is face-to-face -face interaction or instruction with kids. I also know from checking that you probably are not doing a whole lot, and this is a good thing, of what I call um, computer-based instruction. That type of instruction, you know, even when you look at RTI, now if RTI uh, is doing what it's designed and intended to do, by the time a child gets to high school, it should start phasing out. Sometimes we see that it's not. But I think one of the best pieces of information I could offer there you know, for kids to do computer-based instruction, look, they know they re need remediation. I, by the way, have taught remediation in Florida, both math and reading. So I do understand here. I, one of the things that I personally have done is picked up the phone and talked to people. I've gone to schools to witness what they're doing. And in a lot of cases, you know, uh, kids need a lot of repetition. They won't tell you that. 
And we also know this from a reading standpoint, it takes about 17 exposures to a word to build that vocabulary. Any time that, that a student is reading, they're building vocabulary. I think promoting reading, uh, you know, 20 minutes a day, you're doing some of that already. I think to continue to maybe even possibly stretch that to 30 minutes. I also think that parent buy-in is real important for that as well, to get parents to sit down with kids. Now. Um, you're right, uh, state law says, right, that if a student is not on track in reading by the end of third grade, they what? They get retained. So I think with our numbers being low, I've kind of glanced at those at a few schools, I think that's important as well. I think let's don't reinvent the wheel and let's take a look at what we can do to better enhance opportunities for kids. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Yes. Would you describe what an ideal Board of Education would do to assist you with those goals? Well, one of the things I'd like to challenge the Board on is this, and you'll probably do this anyway, whether I'm your new director or not, and I hope and pray that I am, but I will say this. Um, I would like to say that the Board could, could, you could develop a strategic plan for the Director of Schools and allow that document to become a working component of the school system at large. Now, that may be from wanting to see, you know, schools receive, we've heard the state talk about receiving a grade, this and that. Um, you know, everybody was held harmless on achievement this past year, um, you know, or back in 20 because we didn't test. So, you know, an ideal, an ideal board um, would be aware of the goals, know the goals that we have, you would set a strategic plan for the director, hold them accountable. I think that's important. I don't have a problem with accountability because I certain don't, certainly don't have a problem with working hard and trying to get the results. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hagel. Um, I'm going to skip down to my fourth question, um, which is question number 17. How visible should a director of schools be in our schools and our community? Very visible. It's what my previous history, it's not uncommon for me to travel 100 miles um, and talk with parents and go to a high school football game on the road away. I try to strategically theme uh, each day. For example, on Mondays it might be curriculum, on Tuesdays instruction, Wednesdays it could be attendance and so on. On Fridays, you know, I would try to get out in the schools especially with me being new, people don't know me, so I'm meeting a lot of new people. It's so important for the uh, director of schools to be highly visible. Sometimes it's important for the director to get out and speak to different uh, public organizations, such as the Rotary Club, for example. So the director of schools needs to be highly visible in our schools and in our communities. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Miller, the, the other three questions that I have, you've already answered them. You did a great job on all three of them. And uh, so I'm going to pass it on to Mr. Brock. Thank you, Mr. Ruman. Could we do a time check? Because sure. Uh, I, I, want, I want Dr. Miller to have ample opportunity to we, could we have do a, a closing. Could we have a, a four-minute recess while I take a bathroom break? Or do I just need to leave? I'd like to listen to his answers. We're at 54 minutes. Well, we're right now time for his uh, his closing remarks. I guess I can wait. <laughs> can you can you hold on for just five minutes? Yes, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Miller, I think you've actually you've answered a large portion of all of our questions uh, already. And uh, so, what we wanted to do with the last five minutes is give you five minutes to. Uh, uh, give a closing statement or come up with any, any discussion that you'd like to have uh, that we've not covered yet. Okay, well, Lord, thank, first of all, as I started out, thank you so much. And, uh, and I really am appreciative, personally and professionally, with having the opportunity to come here and meet with you today. Um, you simply have a great school system. Now, um, could we be a better school system? Yes. For example, as I looked at your AC or your graduation rate, you know, low 90s, high 80s, okay, between both high schools. Um, you know, I'm accustomed to having accountability on about a 95% graduation rate, for example. So are there some opportunities with instructional classified salaries? Yes. So there are some opportunities to take a look at things, okay? Um, I will say this, and... Uh, I actually know a candidate or two that's interviewing for this position. I've just known them previously in the educational profession. They're acquaintances. But I will say this, 
and look at you very, with, with a kindred spirit, very honestly. You can hire board anyone you choose for this position. It might be me. It might not be me. But I can promise you this. As I look at each of you, you're not going to hire anyone that's going to outwork me. My work shows. I know time doesn't permit. I mean, these are weekly updates for four years of superintendent work, different components. Um, they're not out there. I am not that confident. But I will tell you, I believe I'm a unique candidate for the position, and since I'm not that confident, I will say this, I'm that right. And if a person's not right in what they believe, then who else is going to, right? Um, Lee Iacocca, the former CEO of Chrysler, once said about teachers and education, and I'll kind of close with an item or two here. He said, in a complete rational society, the best of us would aspire to be teachers. Hmm. And the rest of us, no disrespect, board, would have to settle for something less. Because passing along civilization from one person to the next ought to be the highest calling that anyone could ask for. You're, by a governing body, you have a lot of power. I know personally and professionally that you respect that power. Uh, with all due respect, I say this. If I'm God's man or person for this job, you don't have the power to stop it. Please, no, I say that respectfully to you in the positions you're in. If I'm his person, you don't have the power to stop it. And if I'm not his person, he'll show you a different person, and he'll show you a way, and then he'll show me a way. And I want you to know I'm very humbled to be in your presence today for this opportunity. Question or two I might have since I'm out of county, and I'll Kind of close here. Are you going? Do you need to require the director of schools? It's about an hour drive for me, from my home in Morgan County. Do you need to require? Because I did live in Claiborne. It's about a two-hour drive. Do you require the director of schools to live in county, or is that something you don't know yet? We have not uh, discussed that. I don't believe it's any requirement as of right now, um, but. Um, that may be something that, that may be discussed later, but uh, but no, right, as of right now, we do not have a requirement for like that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Emmett and board. Um, what about timeline? When do you anticipate maybe being able to reach a decision and or do you anticipate a second round of interviews? And I've engaged in those before. As of right now, we do not have uh, um, an inclination to have a second round of interviews as of right now that may change. Um, right now we are scheduled to meet in another special call meeting on April the 12th to, uh, to vote. So we, we will be finishing up our interviews today and April 12th we have a special call meeting and we will start voting at that particular time and we have no earthly idea how it's going to go. <laughs> You know, I'll go back to one more thought, and I'll close this. I've gone back to the school, back to the teachers. I will tell you, you often hear, I'm teaching physical education, by the way. I'm certified in physical education. They need a physical education at, their, at one of their schools in Morgan County, so I have fulfilled that role this year. Um, I will say this, that I have really learned what teachers are going through with COVID and all the other restraints and constraints on their jobs. You know, we often hear about teachers having a hard time getting their standards in and they're pacing with their curriculum. I want you to know that I'm living that currently. My evaluations, by the way, from the principal are excellent, okay? And I will tell you, I've enjoyed this year as a teacher, and I'll tell you, I don't want the board to look at that as being a negative. It's actually been a positive for me. It's allowed me to reconnect with teachers. That's one thing to walk into a school and go into a classroom but I'm actually doing the teaching. So it's allowed me to become better connected with teachers. So that is a positive. At board, is there anything else I can answer for you that maybe is not on the sheet here? 
I don't think so. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Miller. We appreciate you being here. You did a great job. Yes. Hurry, Mr. Mac, or, uh, Safety. Hurry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I will take this point to exit. <laughs> thank you, Jimmy. Okay. Well, I got it. <laughs>